October 16th school committee meeting to order. Any public input? Uh, seeing none, <laughs> we will uh, the uh, consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Anyone have any that like removed? All those in favor? Five zero. Now we will have reports. Mario. Um, well, uh, I know that uh, fall musical is coming up. Uh, Pippin uh, production, uh, November 10th and 12th, um, and the 17th and 19th. Uh, other than that, um, I know seniors are from our client uh, dealing with uh, college applications. Uh, mm. So oh, that's pretty starting good. already. Yeah, some early uh, early action. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Knight? Um, I'm going to let Elaine talk okay. about uh, yeah. our CASA. Oh, our um, annual meeting and yeah. Dr. Ruth Fortney. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, I think that was two weeks ago. We had the RACASA annual meeting and we had our district, att district attorney um, and Dr. Ruth Pote, and they both um, spoke on um, uh, Dr. Pote's expertise is around sort of a pediatric addiction issues and uh, marijuana. And she really, both of them spoke very powerfully um, about the linkage between um, sort of early usage, first usage, and you know how that can affect addic ad the rates of addiction later on. And they really, one of the things they did was really commend actually um, our district, our superintendent, um, Rakasa, Erica McNamara, and the police chief, um, and the support of the police department for really all the really incredibly good proactive work from um, the screening that we did, you know, the, the youth risk behavior survey, and really monitoring that data and taking action based on that data. Oh, look at the discussion. Um, <laughs> And uh, she, Dr. Pote, really sort of held the district and the and the um, coalition and the and the chief up as a model. And um, I think the, you know, the we would have liked to see the attendance be much bigger. Um, and it's yeah. and it's such an, a critical issue, and it's just a struggle to figure out how to get people out so that they can be educated and informed on how to be proactive, what to look for, what's important. You know, why is it important to talk to your kids about not using marijuana and not using alcohol? Why is it important for you to role model as an adult behavior that, that says something diff that shows what you want them to do? Not, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because that really doesn't work that effectively, as it turns out. Um, so the, I think that the down part of it was that there wasn't um, as many people there from the community as we would have liked. Um, those of us who have been passionate about this for many years who are um, in the room. But it, she was great to hear speak, Dr. Pote. So thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. So you're, you're on the agenda. Sure, I'm on the agenda, but I do have a quick report. Um, so the CPAC. They met on October 4th. Um, we went through some of the OCR information again and kind of talked about some of the information that I included in the memo that I'll be going over later. We discussed some upcoming PD and a new board has been elected. Um, Alicia just came in. She's no longer on our board. Um, but Sarah McLaughlin, Sarah Scafidi, Julie Wall, and Terry Texera are now the CPAC board and they were just meeting prior to this to discuss their structure that they'd like to have as a board and it seems that they will be operating as co-chairs um, versus a president. So it's great we have some new parents who are willing to step up and um, become, take on some leadership roles and we're appreciative of those who served prior to them but it is exciting that we're generating new families who want to participate. Um, I wanted to update the board that we continue to have a vacancy for the speech and language position at the high school. I think I had mentioned that I was going to share with you some of the information about that. 
So the position has been posted four times since the end of the June school year. The position was, for three of those postings, the position was only a 0.8 position. This last time we posted it, we increased that to a 1.0 in the hopes of attracting some sort of candidate. Um, the first posting that we had, we had three applicants for the position. The second posting, we had two applicants. The third posting, we had three applicants. And with our most recent one, we have two applicants, so we're hoping to bring those in. The position has been offered to two people who have backed out once we have offered the position. We've reached out to two agencies that sometimes have helped us fill positions. I think it's, it's Panorama and Delta T. We haven't had a lot of luck identifying a credentialed person. I've also contacted Commonwealth Learning Center because they've helped us out um, at different times, as well as Linda Mood Bell, who has provided some support for us. Neither of them have a speech and language pathologist that they could recommend. We also posted um, through some of my connections on the board that I'm, I serve on for the International Dyslexia Association. There are a couple of speech and language pathologists, um, two of whom work out of MGH at the Institute of Health Professionals where they actually run um, a training program. So we've posted the position through their career services office and again in hopes of just kind of getting a different audience. Um, right now we are utilizing a private speech and language pathologist named Teresa Sadowski to do most of our evaluations. Um, and if she's available, she does service students, but she's not available to really fill the position. Mm -hmm. We're also reviewing the speech and language schedules of other SLPs in the district, but as you all know, we don't want to have a gap in another building to meet this need because we'll be in a similar situation. All the families have been notified. They received a letter indicating that we have this vacancy and that once the position is filled, we'll be able to document and develop a plan for compensatory services. Um, but we really can't put a proposal out right now because we wouldn't know how many services they've missed until we fill the position. So it's really not a great position to be in, but we've definitely been struggling. And as you can see from the numbers of actual applicants, we aren't getting a high number of applicants mm -hmm. um, for the position. Thank you. So one other thing, uh, Dr. Doxter submitted a report from the CPAC as well, which I'll uh, put with the minutes. Great. So. And I do have one other piece for the board to know is that we did receive another complaint from the Office for Civil and Rights, another OCR complaint. Um, it is a disability-based allegation. At this point, again, they are allegations. And the only piece I can report out to you is that on November 1st, we have to submit documentation. Um, we won't have any further information. As you know, when we presented the last one, the timeline was over a year before we actually had a finding. Um, we'll continue to keep you updated on the process, but we've just received an allegation and are pulling together the documentation. Where is the uh, OCR? Right now, we are, we're choosing not to share it because we're in the midst of kind of investigating. So I'd, I'd prefer to just kind of leave it in that we had, we do have a disability base. Um, we're not, not going to indicate where, at what particular level of the building that it's at. We weren't going to do that at this. Yeah, point. at this point, we we're still we gathering information and sending the it. Process. Wouldn't that be public information, though? I mean, if somebody requested it, yeah. wouldn't we have to It, it would be, mm -hmm. but at this point, we feel that we need to get the information to OCR, then we'll be more than happy to, to share more with the committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I had a question Concerned. about the vacancy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're clearly struggling to fill it. <coughs> what do you attribute that to? Like, the point eight was one possibility? That do you have any thing. insight into what the challenge is? Um, I think that it's a hard position to fill, in my sense. I think there are openings. I also think high school is a, we had this struggle with our reading specialists as well. I think finding um, people with that training to work at the high school level is a little more of a challenge as we experience with the reading specialists, which is why we switched that to a special ed teacher and we did some training around reading in order to fill that position. So we attracted our goal in that position was to attract someone who was a special ed teacher for high school, and then we have been training them. And, okay. and, but that strategy wouldn't work no. in this instance no, it's because it's a highly specialized. Yes, it's speech and language. Thank, Thank you. you. So, 
You know, I think um, I'm just wondering if it's also has to do with sort of the support that that we provide, and I don't know, you know, how that um, is out in the in the teacher universe as mm -hmm. people are looking for jobs, but you know, to draw sort of a different example when we're looking for an elementary principal, the fact that we don't have assistant principals and we have sort of a teacher that provides some backup support mm -hmm. is, is a little, a negative compared to a district that has um, a elementary assistant principal. So I'm just sort of also wondering, is that something that you feel is in play here or not in terms of do, do people look at it and say, mm -hmm. these jobs are more difficult because we don't really get this there's not as much support, or do people not really see that from right. the outside? This is, a, this is a position in the teacher's bargaining unit, so it's not a, it's actually a pretty kind of standard caseload and management type of so job. So it wouldn't so. be viewed as something that is, you know, it's har it's harder to do in Reading. No, no, I wouldn't say that mm -hmm. would be true for this position. No. It's I just a more, very difficult position. Say, there yeah. is not a deep pool of candidates to right. begin with, and this time of year is even less. So is the posting at um, MGH, so that that's sort of looking at a little bit different universe of people that might be qualified, but right. sort of a different, a different, trying to get a different pool, a bigger, a wider yes. pool. Well, and the, they run a program for mm -hmm. speech and language, so they run a program that um, people come out of that's a dual certification. It's in speech and language and reading, which would be fantastic. So that's why I thought they might be a good match for us to find a candidate out of that. And we have had some candidates from um, MGA to come to us from that program. So mm -hmm. we thought it might be a great way to attract. Um, so we're just kind of continually getting it out there. And mm -hmm. So how do we yes. meet the, the, the requirements or the IEP requirements for the students there? We're not able to meet them right now because we don't have someone to provide it. Um, which is unfortunate. That's why I said we're looking to look at other schedules. We do have someone who comes in, but she's not able to commit the time. So our focus has been on having her complete the evaluations that we need to. Um, Could that be another potential uh, civil rights violation? Or? Uh, but we have documented all the things that we're doing. So it's not that we're not trying. We're making a lot of attempts, and that's the guidance we've always received from the department, which is why I wanted to share with you all kind of the, the steps we've taken. This uh, position became open the end of June. We received notice um, from the person who was in the position. So it wasn't something we could have posted at the time, that's like right. in April. Yeah. So we, we posted late for this position, but that's when we received notice from that person that they would not be returning. So, so it did also have an impact, because when you post the end of yeah. June. Uh, less candidates. Yeah, you get less candidates at that point. Just, yes. You did say, though, that you're working on establishing and, and coming up with what compensatory yes. services would yeah. be for yep. each of the families yep. once we know sort of what that, once we get a resource in, and then you can yes. say what yes. the sort of totality yep. of that is. So you're already in communication yep. with tracking, the families. And we're tracking all right. the missed services, and we'll be providing, as we talked about when I went over the mid-cycle review, that we'll be providing them a letter that outlines at least two options for them in terms of accessing compensatory services. So it may be that we offer something after school. We may be able to offer something during the school day, depending on their child's schedule. Um, and then most likely we'll offer something during extended school year or during the summertime that families could access. It's not ideal, and I, I don't want to portray that it is. This isn't a great situation. But um, we are making every effort to try to find someone. Um, and, and it's been very challenging. Hmm. Yeah, oh yes, I'm sorry. Two, two questions. One, any feedback you've gotten from, you mentioned there were two candidates who accepted yeah. and then didn't begin yeah. the position. I'm interested yeah. in you know, what, you, what we learned from that. And secondly, in terms of meeting the IEPs, which, which is required, obviously, by the law, are, is, is there a proposal that you could make to us or, or you know, about what, it would, what the cost would be for, I don't know, if out-of-district services are available to meet the students' requirements or... You know, hiring someone from you know the private sector as opposed to an FTE. Yeah, Do we those have that? Are, those are the options I've been exploring. That's okay. what Panorama and Delta T are. They're staffing agencies that help you find someone. They have not been able to produce a candidate at this point, so we are looking at contracting privately. But but not not to fill the position, although that's yeah. that's certainly the goal. 
I'm just talking about providing the service. Like, yeah, can, that's, can what, we, that's what they would do. But, but actually send them somewhere to receive well, the service. Well, then we would also have to incur that. the cost for transportation. I know, but so. the question is, do we have a price on what it would cost I, to I meet the IEPs? I can absolutely look into that. But, bottom but, line, we, we've got to meet these IEP requirements, don't we? That's a question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we should know what that would cost and if we can do it. I would think that would have a really big impact on the rest of their day, but yeah. Um, can I, I just, so those two agencies, are you, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, are they, are they trying to help find the permanent yes. candidate? No. They're they are trying, staffing, staffing to provide, provide someone a, who can be can here. They find a speech pathologist yeah. who can come here. Even if it's temporary. For temporary. But they're qualified yeah. teachers. They have all yeah. the right certifications. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's what they do. These companies, they <laughs> find the people and they bring them to you to mm -hmm. provide the service. I'm happy to look into that. The challenge for most of our students at the high school level is their involvement in extracurricular activities. Right. And also, yeah. as you know, their schedule rotates, so they don't have a consistent time, typically, that that service is provided. So we have, that's where the challenge comes with either sending a student somewhere else um, because it's not like they have, it's the same time every day. Uh, for that student, so. Hold on a second. Dr. Dart, has there ever been a precedent where with certain positions uh, we require a certain number of days notice uh, as opposed to, you know, just coming up on the 30th of the month and saying I'm all done after this year's so, old? You know what I'm, like, with a normal, with a at the end with of a school year, At the end of a school year, it doesn't. There is no time requirement. I, During the I school year, there, there is. there isn't one now. I'm saying is that something that's ever been explored for certain uh, what I would consider hard-to-fill type positions? or. Well, During the school year, there is a time requirement. Okay. It's, um, I believe, 30 school days in the contract. It's in the teacher's contract. Right. Um, and, yeah, um, but at the end of the school year, we, we can't hold a staff member. Yeah. Because they don't start again until September mm -hmm. so they in another school right. district. So so. More but the more contract than runs until Right. Until but August. there's no, we have nothing that, to hold that person to stay here. And you have a date, it wouldn't matter because it's 30 days. So. Right. <clears throat> the other question was about I'm the sorry. feedback from the candidates. Mm -hmm. I can ask um, the HR administrator. I'm not involved in that process. Um, those hiring decisions are made at the building level, as you recall, and so I'm just reporting out the information, but I'm happy to get that information. Yes. Yeah, um, I, I understand um, where Nick is coming from, but I don't really think it's a good use of um, Mrs. Wilson's time to investigate this, because I think the other things that she's working on are much more likely to yield a result, and we, we've, al we've already said we're going to provide compensatory services. I just don't think that looking at the likelihood that the high school students are going to be able to work a particular time into their schedule when the schedules are so changeable, I, don't, I just don't think it's a good use of her time. I don't, and I'm not sure that, you know, I mean, we're talking about it here, but ultimately Dr. Darty should be able to review that request and decide whether it's a good use of her time. Yes. Um, I <clears throat> have a, a thought, too, on what Mr. Bogan was su suggesting, and it's really a question for you. If, in the event that that were a viable solution, and I, I'm, I sort of share your concerns about the, just the logistics of it, I don't know how that would even work, but even hypothetically if it could, would that be a decision, that, would that be a change enough that an IEP team would have to be involved? It would really depend on what we ultimately we're, we're doing. Right. It's because, because each of those plans is yes. so individual. Yes. I can't envision a situation where the yes. district comes in and says, okay, this right. group of students, we're going to do something radically different. I mean, I would right. assume that would have to go through parents' IEP terms. Right. How and does this impact other of, surgery? So yeah. And just, a lot of that work that we're doing with students in this area is really trying to carry that over into the general yeah. setting. Yeah. A lot of that work might be on social interactions. Yeah. That the goal is that you're applying that in the greater school community, right. not just in your 30-minute or 58-minute session. So. Um, it's really up to the committee in terms of looking at that. We're still looking at the agencies, um, 
and we do have two candidates who have applied in the last week. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I imagine an individual student might have other disabilities that you would want to have a discussion as a team about, and mm -hmm. you know, you're not just treating this one thing. There mm -hmm. might be other, you know, mm -hmm. it just it would yeah. seem like a highly individualized decision, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, I'm all set. Okay, so for the remainder of the evening, we'll we'll have the uh, data presentation uh, followed by the uh, special education report, and then the uh, year-end budget report, and then a discussion on the calendar because the regarding. A change in the previously voted calendar uh, because of Veterans Day. So, so we can jump into the da data presentation. Great. Um, so, in a few minutes, I'm going to turn this over to Carolyn Wilson, and then ultimately to Courtney Fogarty, our district data coach. Um, but I'm actually very pleased to kind of get a chance to kick off this brief presentation as I really think it touches upon some of what I think is some of the more exciting work that we're doing in our district and some of the work that I think will be potentially the most impactful not only for all of our students but for all of our staff as well in supporting them. Um, tonight, to be very sort of upfront about this, it's not a presentation about any specific data uh, or the reporting out of any particular scores um, on any particular area. But rather, this is a presentation about how we are building capacity um, among our entire staff um, in new ways to meaningly, meaningfully inform our decisions about students and their progress. Um, I think as a teacher, maybe I know that it's important to explain what something is not in addition to what it is. Um, and so I really want to sort of stress that while examining and, and reporting out on specific data is very important, um, building the capacity for the process of that is also extremely important, and in many ways even perhaps more important for some districts to do well for a district. So essentially tonight's presentation is not the, uh, about what, but it's about the how. Um, so a couple of quick thoughts about our cover slide here. First, I wanted to say something about the little quote that we have on there. Um, not everything that can be counted counts. Not everything that counts can be counted. Um, in tackling this topic successfully, I think this little quote captures what I think is some, a concept that's really in the heart of teachers, of educators. Um, that it, it's saying, in essence, that while we have an abundance of valuable data available to us as educators, all classroom teachers would tell you that there are countless items so crucially vital to every child's development and success that are really very difficult to measure, or at the very least, they really don't show up, sometimes until years later in, in a child's achievement. Um, but any teacher knows that while these many things might be hard to count, they really do count a lot in creating the type of school that a child feels very welcome to come to each and every day. Um, in, pre in preparing all students for their future. You know, things like each time a teacher, you know, helps a child gradually regulate his or her behavior to be more successful. Um, each time a teacher is encouraging a student to maybe consider that they are capable of goals that they might not have even ever set for themselves. Um, or many other sort of countless, innumerable small moments that happen hundreds of times a day in every classroom. Um, those all, all count tremendously, but are hard to capture in data. In many ways, as I said, sometimes they do show up indirectly years later in the achievement or progress that a child is making. But we wanted to mention that because we think that really is in the heart of teachers. Um, I love that this one, well, put Courtney in the spot for a second. I love that this quote is on Courtney's office door because it really shows us 
how she understands um, how to connect with educators um, and how she, that she knows how to leverage data in a way that will help us build new capacities in all of us, really. Um, so I think we're very fortunate to have her because she not only has such great expertise in the data, but she has these sensibilities that I really do think connects with the values and heart of educators. Um, Data-driven versus data-informed. I want to say something really quickly about that. You know, I think I've said before that I, in some other presentations, I personally I really don't like the phrase data-driven, but prefer data-informed. And for the most part in our district, I think we use that phrase. Um, I found a, a little excerpt from an article that I thought was relevant here, and it was especially meaningful to me because it was actually applies um, to businesses. It was actually from Forbes magazine a couple of years ago. Basically saying how, you know, making the point that it's data is an invaluable and persuasive source of business insight. But when it comes to making that insight work, don't let data completely overrule your human instincts and experience. Being data informed is about striking a balance in which your expertise and understanding of information plays as great a role in your decisions as the information itself. It's like flying an airplane. No matter how sophisticated the systems on board are, a highly trained pilot is ultimately responsible for making decisions at critical junctures. Far from taking decision-making away from people, data can actually make them better at it by giving them more inputs to work with. It's like GPS for in your car. When the system presents you with all the available options, you have more information with which to assess what you want to do next. That captures one of the reasons, I think, why being data-informed resonates more powerfully with teachers than being data driven. Um, our teachers are our drivers who are utilizing their GPS to reach certain outcomes with their students. They are our experienced airplane, airplane pilots. Um, and it's a very important as we do this work to never minimize their experience, their daily interactions mm -hmm. with, with students. Um, and how well they get to know their students through the course of day after day and applying that data in meaningful ways. I also wanted to say, and we've talked a little bit about this before, that when it comes to using data in this way, I think it's important to sort of understand up front as we do this work that for many educators, especially in some districts, data has really been associated mostly with accountability measures, um, mandated policies that they see sometimes as top-down, um, without really the local districts doing the necessary work to create the capacity to make that successful. Um, as a result, many authors over the last several years have talked about the, the detrimental impact that it's had in morale in the profession. And I think it's important to understand that up front, that in doing this work as a district, we have to acknowledge that, and, and we have to make sure that we're not falling into this, tra into this trap. Um, Michael Fullen, great scholar in the field of education, the quote at the top there is his, and a uh, couple of these slides refer to him. He's saying standards and accountability are exceedingly weak strategies for driving reform. In other words, I believe he's saying that accountability and standards are absolutely crucial. They're essential. We need them as part of the process. They're just a terrible way to start change. Right. A little bit later in his book, Michael Fullen has a chart. There's a few quotes there. But he talks about what are the best drivers for change. And this has been very important to us as we've been doing this work in the last year or more. Um, and he says, instead of accountability, even though it's a very essential step and, it, and all of us need to be held accountable for the results that we want, the right way to drive change, to start a reform process, is through capacity building. Um, and he gives some other examples there of the wrong versus right. Instead of putting the burden on individual solutions, um, focusing on collaborative efforts, instead of any one particular strategy, whether that's technology or a particular program or anything like that, it really is about the systemic approach and the overall pedagogy. I mean, in defense of policymakers, um, legislators, and so forth, whether you're talking about 
legislators or departments of education, um, the state departments and so forth, this often is their only lever to force change, but it really is up to us, I believe, in the field at the district level um, in leading and guiding this change to keep this in mind that our first responsibility needs to uh, be collaborative and incorporate the expertise that we have in our staff and to build the capacity in all of us um, to guide us through that. So before I turn it over, I, I think I've shown a version of this maybe a year, or maybe more ago, and that is really how you build capacity. And I think this slide kind of captures well, I'm not going to read it all, obviously, but it really kind of shows the framework for capacity building and how collaborating effectively is key there. Um, you know, whether that's creating a shared leadership in each of the schools clearly defining the desired student outcomes and then aligning our PD to support those, understanding that accountability for student learning is shared among all of us as a team. It doesn't fall on the shoulders of a particular educator or just the classroom teacher. It really is on all of us. And then also becoming comfortable with collaboratively um, examining and discussing student work, which is happening more and more throughout our district. Um, this type of systemic capacity building is really vital um, and that's what this presentation is really about okay so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of our overall objective so we've talked in the past about our multi-tiered system of support the MTSS model that's our framework so we really in looking at improving student outcomes improving outcomes for all students we want to look at our data as one piece, our systems and our practices to help improve those outcomes. So this work is important because the way we look at data, as um, Mr. Martin said, is not just to inform, is not just to drive us, but to inform our practice. We want to have our teachers improve their craft. We want them reflecting on their practice based on the information that they're gathering from classroom observation, from, from hard data that we're collecting, but we want them to create, create a culture where there's reflection on practice, improving practice. We also, um, when you look at how we're doing this work um, in question number four, we are looking at data and having collaborative data conversations at every different level. So we have these conversations at our district administrative leadership team. We have a district-wide team, which includes teachers and administrators that are looking at different data points, all related to those same goals we've established as a district. Because as when Dr. Doherty presents, there's an alignment between the goals we have as a district and the data we're collecting and reflecting on at these different meetings to the building leadership teams down to teacher individual um, goals in their evaluation. And this process, our goals are that this process through this reflection, collaboration, through different lenses looking at similar data, that we are improving the practices of our teachers and also improving those outcomes for our students because everyone is looking at the data from their perspective. As a, as a district-wide administrator, for instance, I look at data patterns very different than a classroom teacher would. And that's an important lens to have, and that's why it's important that different people look at it and share their perspectives. When we talk about um, data, we often talk about achievement versus progress. And I really like this slide because oftentimes we are thinking about that achievement piece. We talk a lot about performance on the MCAS or the PARC, which is achievement. It's a point in time that measures how a student is doing. But progress is really another important piece that we have to work as, um, as with our teachers on because we want to see growth. And we want to look at how students are making growth from one year to the next. I equate this to the IEP process that each IEP has an annual measurable goal that should show the progress that the student is making um, over time. We want to see that growth for students and not just focus on that one achievement point, which is, again, a shift for some of our teachers in practice and in collaboration. Um, and then finally, some of the guiding questions that we really think about and sort of challenge our teachers to think about is what do we want each student to learn? <coughs> How will we know that each student has learned it? 
How will we respond when a student experiences difficulty in learning? And how will we deepen the learning for students who have already mastered essential knowledge and skills? So these questions are questions we have as our teachers collaborate. Um, as you remember, they collaborate in their building leadership teams to look at data. They collaborate in their PLCs, their professional learning communities, to look at different data points. They have grade level meetings. So there's many opportunities for our teachers to reflect on how students are doing and ways they can change what they're doing in the classroom to either respond to those students who are struggling or to extend the lesson for those students who are ready to move beyond that. So as Mr. Martin said, it really is about shifting the culture in our school so that our teachers are feeling comfortable utilizing the data we're collecting and also utilizing that instinct they have as a teacher and, and working together in groups to discuss this information. So now I'm going to turn it over to Courtney Fogarty, our data analyst, to give us an example of how the process works. <coughs> Before this kind of went through the why and why we look at data, why we're using it in our district, uh, why we want all eyes on it, not just one person in an office. Um, and I'm going to look at the how. How do teams take that information and turn it into actionable steps? How do you take the overall MCAS scores and turn it into changing practice? Because uh, you guys see a lot of data come through here. You see the YRBS presentation that Eric and McNamara gave in the summer. Uh, how are we using that? How are we taking that from the beautiful sli slides that Erica had to actionable steps at our district level, at our buildings, and in our classrooms? Because the biggest challenge, uh, you heard a list of people looking at information. The biggest challenge is finding a way for all these people to draw a line between the overall outcome and what they do in the classroom. And that takes a lot of effort, because um, you've got a lot of people on that shift that you're trying to change course with. So I actually will go through an example of, it, it is real data, it's from a survey that we took at the end of the year, we take it every year, it's called the DCA, the District Capacity Assessment. Um, but, and I'll be taking you through it using the steps that we uh, use to go through any data, including MCAS, including YRBS. Uh, we've started those efforts with both of those things and a couple others. Um, and I thought this would be a great way to show you. Also because the reports for the DCA are broken down in exactly this manner. So it kind of uh, helps you walk from the uh, bird's eye view to the, the in-classroom view. So to start with the resources, uh, because we didn't come up with this process out of nowhere, and it wasn't just because of me, it wasn't just like, hey, this is my idea, let's go with it. It's based off of a couple of main resources that we use. Data analysis for continuous school improvement was something I use, used in my last district. It's out of UCLA with uh, Victoria, Dr. Victoria Bernhardt. Um, it takes a really big systems approach at looking at data. It helps you organize from that bird's eye view. Um, for actual data, there's a resource and protocol book from the School Resource um, Institute, which um, Jean Thompson Grove works with. And that one is to help especially collect qualitative data between within conversations between adults. It's for facilitating and validly collecting qualitative information from your conversations. Um, solving disproportionality and achieving equity is a great way, it's, it's a new aspect that I've never gotten to work with, and it's a great way to use quantitative data to assess sometimes more qualitative things like um, disproportionality in uh, office referrals and grading and e even class enrollment. So that's something we're working on. Data-wise, is that of Harvard University. It's a really great program from their School of Education. Um, and it has really good practices and a six-step wheel for building and classroom teams. So we're working on building capacity that way. And the ultimate building capacity book is the Data Coach's Guide for Improving Learning for All Students. It kind of has a scope and sequence, so to speak, of how to take teams through this work so that I have kind of a backbone for how to do it so that, just so you know, I'm not doing it out of nowhere. Um, and that one's really helpful and is used by the um, teachers, research for better teachers in active maths. I don't know if anyone's ever um, taken a class there. And a really important quote that we got from researchers at the PBIS um, 
uh, national gathering, which is in Chicago a couple weeks ago, was Don't Build Data Systems, Build Decision Systems. This was from Rob Corner um, out of the University of Oregon. Um, and it was echoed by many of his colleagues from around the country. Our goal here isn't to build the biggest uh, computer system with all the bells and whistles that we have. Um, it's really to build a system where we know when to make decisions, how to make decisions, and with what, uh, instead of focusing on should it be Excel sheets, should it be this, should it be that, should we pay $20,000 for a fancy system. This is not helping us, because it doesn't matter how fancy a system you get, if nobody knows what to do with it, simply how to use it, what meetings it should be used at, what teammates should be mm -hmm. using it, it's, it's no use. So this is helping us build those decision systems first. Um, and just the ABCs to kind of give you an idea of what we do look at. Um, so the ABCs is the, one of the concepts from uh, DataWise, the Harvard one, and it breaks everything down into A, B, and C, attendance, behavior, and course performance. So there's a lot of data coming at you at all times. As a teacher, as a board member, you have a lot of presentations coming at you, and sometimes you don't know which things you should pay attention to and which things are a little extraneous. This helps you narrow down attendance, behavior, course performance are the main things that a classroom teacher needs to look at when they're making decisions on how to place a student so they don't feel like, okay, I have a lot of observations as well. How do I factor these in? Most teams I work with use at least one of everything. My recommendation is to use at least one of each of these categories. I definitely would not recommend using every single bullet on this page. Um, and most teams use two or three course performance measures because that, you know, that's the nature of our business, right? Um, making sure students are learning and progressing the way that, that we want them to be to be the most successful that we know they can be. And attendance and behavior, since those are a little bit newer concepts for how to work with, uh, teams usually pick one of those to work with or to focus on. Um, for instance, I know some schools use SRSS and SIBS, and that's because they have a tier two either mentoring or checking checkout program. <coughs> they use that specifically for entry criteria as part of their decision making system. Um, yeah, so the levels of analysis comes from the data coaches guide, that one from uh, Research for Public Teaching. And it recommends this triangle, and I really like this because aggregate level's at the top, not because it's important, but it's the smallest, because you should spend the least amount of your time on the overall look. You get the overall look of MCAS scores or something, and you have a reaction to it, and you're yay for successes, or oh no, I don't really like that, and I don't want to know why. But we can't spend our whole year there, because we won't figure out why it happened, or, or what we could change to uh, either keep up the result we liked, or uh, get away from the result we don't like. Um, so then it takes you to, so it recommends that you work from that smallest amount to the biggest amount. I'm not saying that the teacher should have to work with the most data, but it's that they're the ones who gather the most because that's where they were. And they gather through their observations, through their planning, because they use the scope and sequence that the district decided on, and they uh, plan with their grade level team and place students through their observations and their data decisions. So that's where most of the time should be spent, because that's where the, the action really happens, so to speak. So in between that, it goes from disaggregate level to disaggregate, to strand, a strand analysis, and then an item analysis, and then adds in student work and staff voice uh, to get more observational and qualitative information along with um, some of the other things you broke down. So what happens at each level? Just to break it down a little more. So if you're at the aggregate, you look at overall outcomes. That's your bird's eye view, that's usually what you see sent out when there's something going to the public. It's how do we do? What does it look like? Um, the disaggregate level, which is the next step in understanding why did we get why did we get that outcome at the top, is drawing critical comparisons between areas and groups. You can do it between subgroups, like your high needs versus non-high needs, uh, students who've been out 10 or more days versus those who weren't, things like that. And then take it further into strand to collaboratively explore implications of those critical comparisons. What area contributed to the outcome the most? 
what group of students did or what group of students didn't get the support that we feel like they needed and how can we fix that? And then on to item analysis. As you can see, it's going from biggest to smallest in, uh, in the work, but it goes opposite in the time spent on it. Um, determine which parts of the area contributed most and action plan. What's in our control and where can we make the biggest impact? And finally, student work or staff voice, depending on whether you're looking at it from an adult angle or from a student angle. Um, focus on student work and staff voice. What does actual student progress, success, or struggle look like? What does that mean for our action plan? How do we know if we're getting the outcome that we want? And so think about the presentations that you've seen. Think about all the data that you've seen from when Lina shows the report part of, the, of RMHS with the college acceptances and the SAT mean scores and things like that. How do we take that from the top of the pyramid to down here? How do we take the scores that we liked or didn't like? And how do we build off of what we did like? And how do we change the things we weren't happy about? It, it's the same for Y or BS. Uh, Erica did a great job collecting it and putting it together. And she works with it. And how do we work with it? Um, and the next thing is to identify kind of who's at the table for these conversations. Because it should never be one person in a room. There's a reason I'm not a data analyst. I'm a data coach. Um, though I am often crunching numbers in my office. Um, it's just for presentation to work with the team collaboratively so that we can like entirely understand it. So it's not just me. At the top is administrators and district staff. Not because they're the most important, though they really are. Um, <laughs> very important. Um, but because they're the ones looking at the overall view. They're the ones who present the overall view and they're the ones who have to understand what it means and decide where to go next. They're the decision holders, so to speak. Um, collaborative inquiry is the middle two steps for disaggregate and strand. This is where it's the work of building leadership teams, teacher leaders, administrators, and specialists. So this is a team of everybody. It's a big team and they're usually looking at a lot of data. And grade level teams, which are teacher planning time um, with administrators and during their data meetings, which every building has, uh, would be when they start to take it from item to student work. So when they want to say, it's been identified up here that we need to look at math because we didn't like our math scores, it went through a, a leadership team of people who have expertise in math, those teacher leaders, administrators with those trainings, maybe Title I math tutors for specialists. Mm -hmm. And they decided, you know what, we, we think it's inferential thinking or number fluency. And that kind of stuck out to us. Grade level teams, some of whom include some of those teacher leaders, will then take it back to the item and uh, student work and say, let's give a quiz and let's look at those results and see, see what we're seeing. That kind of uh, student work level mm -hmm. uh, data analysis. So I'm going to walk you through the district capacity assessment. And we're going to go at every step. So the one that's lit up is going to be the next slide. So the aggregate level, which is that overall view. You're going to see what our overall district capacity assessment score was for the 16-17 school year. So again, the kind of questions we ask at the aggregate level. How are we doing? So you have the 15, the 16, the 2017, because again, this is an annual survey that we take at the end of the year. And sorry, I, I, my life is full of a lot of acronyms too, so I forget, people don't always remember what like the DCA or district capacity assessment is. Um, but this is our survey that measures uh, how well we're implementing an initiative. And in, in this case, the initiative is multi-tiered systems of, of support. So this was the district team uh, taking the survey. It includes teacher leaders, uh, specialists, and administrators in this one. Um, answering survey questions about how well we're implementing MTSS. And it's been over the past three years. So we see that we went up from the first year, but we definitely went down this third year. And we went down by a fair amount, and we can look at this and we probably have some reactions to it, like, hmm, I don't really like that. I don't know why it went down, and what does that mean for our work? Um, and that's why we can't stop here and we can't base our whole year on, because we don't like this. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, is this, 
subjective or objective criteria that's used here, and what percent respond? Do we capture that in this? Um, in this one, no, but uh, it is a valid, a validated survey given by OSEP, I believe. Yeah. Um, and we don't, we don't calculate the results. It's out of their system, and we will go through each section so you'll see how it's done. Um, off the top of my head, the number of respondents represented were uh, the district, Birch Meadow, Wood End, uh, the high school, Killam, and Joshua Eaton. So it was Barrows and the two middle schools who did not respond in this part. Mm -hmm. And you will see their responses in another section. So are there apples to across all three bars? It's the same respondent pool? It's not. It's the same types of, because the representatives change every year too. So it's not the same people either. And that's a really good point. And that's why we have to, when we're thinking about these results, take into account uh, why things go down. And because I didn't want to make it sound this way, but to one degree, a lot of it is because we did really well last year and we knew what we wanted to do next. And maybe we couldn't do it 100%. So we're pretty hard on ourselves. And we, you choose between a zero, one, and a two. And there were a couple ties where we just ended up going with the lower one because we said, you know, we could do better than that. So we're going to give ourselves a lower score. But I don't want to like sell it off like that because I think we should do better. Um, so that's why we're, we're working that way. So from the aggregate level, we got a 52% this year, 70% being full implementation. Um, this aggregate level, is to make critical comparisons. So the kind of questions you ask at disaggregated levels are, what are where are the successes and areas for improvement? So I wanna have us look mostly at, so has it broken down into even smaller areas, but I want us to look mostly at those lines, maybe those three main sections that are leadership, competency, and organization. And a quick look at this, we say overall, because this is at a disaggregate level, we're looking at groups here, and making critical comparisons. Um, leadership, even though it went down a little bit, is doing okay. That's not my area of most concern. Uh, I would say that we have an area of success, particularly in facilitative administration over there in organization, um, and some overall success in leadership. But then it makes us wonder where are areas for improvement? Because that's what I was wondering when I was looking at this. What can I do to help teams feel like this initiative is being implemented successfully? So I zoned in along with John and Sarah Bird at the time. That was our administrative and coaching team that was looking at this. Because remember, that team's looking at disaggregated. And we took a look at training, coaching, and this decision support data systems, so competency, an organization. We want to know what further do we need to do? We see kind of the areas, but what does that mean? What, what do those phrases even mean? So we need to look a little bit deeper. So for strand, we took it a little bit further. And these are the questions, uh, Mr. Bowman. Um, this is an excerpt of, it's an extract from the page one. I believe it's 12 pages long. Um, and it breaks those questions up into those smaller areas. There were three improvements. There were overall 16 no changes. Uh, seven of them were at the highest score that they could be, which is a two. So those were not areas of immediate improvement. And then seven decreases. So we said, all right, what skills contributed to the problem or success? We celebrated our success for a little bit. We saw the areas we went up in. Um, in facilitated administration. People were feeling really comfortable that we had decision systems for how to start some of this work with MTSS. So there was a quick celebration for that, but then we said, where do we need to get to work? Um, and that was in those areas I pointed out on the last page, which was data systems and coaching in particular. And we said we need to look a little closer. So we went to yeah, item level. Sorry. How long does it take to take that survey? An hour? Couple of hours. Hours. Couple of hours. When do the teachers do that? Last, like the week of the last day of school. Yeah, it's After done school. in June. It's and, and, and there's a third party that facilitates it, just mm -hmm. so you know. Uh, we, we don't self-score it. That yeah, there's OSEP a, administers it. Yeah. 
administers the survey and does the data. They facilitate the, the administration of the survey. And we enter the scores as they say it, and then it uh, calculates out the graphs for us. Thank you. To reduce error. Yep. Um, so we said, all right, we got the areas. It's coaching and uh, data, su data support systems, and I believe <coughs> intervention systems was the other one. And we said, we really want to fix those things. And what are the pieces of that that people reported as being low? And here's the weighting we did. I did this with Sarah Bird and reported out to John in uh, June, right after this is out of June. So we weighted them by area, and what we ended up coming up with was having Again, more acronyms in your life. The DIT has access to the AI. That's the district team has access to data for the initiative. AKA, if people are saying, we want more access to MTSS information. We want more access to data that helps us decide when a student should be placed uh, in a support they need. Or when they're showing success. How do we know that a student is ready to phase out of an intervention? Those kinds of things. Um, and the district team supports the building team in using data for decision making and has a process. Those were the ones that we had some people say two and other people say one. And we decided to go with one because we said if everybody, if everybody doesn't feel 100% on this, then it's not 100%, even if we outvote them. Um, like I said, we're a little hard on ourselves, but I think it kind of leads to us making uh, stronger decisions in the long run. Because this forced us to ask, what skills are connected? Uh, which ones have the most weight, and which ones can we address, especially if they're connected? Um, and that led us to student work slash staff voice, because I didn't want to lean just on this. I wanted to see what other teams, particularly the ones who weren't able to answer the first time, um, had to say about this. So this was every school except the high school and Birch Meadow. It just happened that way. Um, they happened to answer the first time. Um, so these are some of the SRI protocols. This is the one we use in this scenario. It's called the Future Protocol. Uh, and the whole thing behind this was to ask the staff, what does this initiative mean in day-to-day -day life? Uh, what do teachers and administrators want to work on regarding MTSS? Where, where are we missing the mark? And where are we hitting the mark? How can we help you? better understand. Um, so this protocol asks them to think of how MTSS in the ideal world would look like. Mm -hmm. And then how it looks now to them and to identify the steps in between. This is a photo of one of the team's uh, steps in between. And I helped us and I wrote down all the responses and coded them uh, to determine which ones had the most responses, which ones had come from teams that have responded before and it came we came up with um, the biggest things being time access to data and help with interventions and it further and there are further details as to what they meant by time they said we don't like being taken out for full days we said you got it we're gonna let's get rid of that uh, they said we want data to come, half the teams wanted it to be immediate electronically, some of the bigger schools wanted it to be on a schedule where it's quarterly. You got it, we'll set it up that way. Um, and now what we've done, uh, planning off of this and planning off of what they ask for with help with interventions and with help with access to data, is we redesigned our district team to have more eyes on the data and to have a coaching system in place for me to help them with their building teams. So mm -hmm. five times a year, all the schools and repre uh, representatives, two representatives with the administrator come to a data meeting where we go through the data that they want to work on for their particular school goals. And then they also get to share out with other schools on interventions, uh, particularly schools at their own level. So um, we took that beginning bar graph, yep. we went all the way from there to a comprehensive plan of what people want and how we can make this better so that we can fully serve students and, and help students get the support they need when they need it. Um, 
and go through a process so that it's not one person telling them what to do. Everyone thought about it and everyone had a chance to voice uh, their opinions. So, yeah. So, a really good presentation. To, I don't want to interrupt before the end of it. No, the I, th slide. I think that was the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> if there was one more slide. Um, can we go to slide, tw it's slide 12 in our materials? Um, it, it's the actual yeah. survey questions. It's a little bit small, but I had a question about that. There you go. So, I hear three parts to this, and I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So, if I'm going, so part one is is this. In June, we have certain key educators, administrators, and district take a survey, which we don't create, and we don't look at the results for as a district. Right? Right. And the survey has these questions, and and you have certain criteria zero, one, two that each respondent grades, but it's it's their asse individual assessment of that criteria. So it's, there is I think I'm a one, a zero, or a two, or is there a specific <coughs> description of what a one means so that everybody, one means the same thing to everybody? There is, yeah, thank you for asking that. That's a really important distinction. So there is a table that goes along with everyone who's responding to this. They have a table of, at this question, this is what a zero means, and this, because it does differ on each question. It'll say evidence of this being a two would look like um, so, wow. so, so there is a subjective, like matching, but the criteria is objective. So as best we can, yes. we're asking people to read from the same objective criteria for each of these, but they're going to obviously bring their own perspective yes. to that. Okay, so that's that's the we're, we're gathering data that way. The second piece of it that I heard is a different piece, and that's the last slide you had. So we get this data in June, right, and then we have this, which is a different approach, right? This is. Mm -hmm putting people in a room and handwriting out kind of, it's, it's like collecting information from people and kind of, you know, writing it down and organizing it in sure. a logical way. Yes, qualitative right. research through a validated um, protocol. So you're following yeah. the protocol on the right mm -hmm. to get the output yep. on, the, on the left on your slide. So the third piece then that I didn't hear much about was the actual student data. So for MTSS, mm -hmm. <coughs> there are certain things we, we track in our buildings for students' attendance is probably one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are others. Um, how, does, how do these three parts work together? That's what I want to understand. So how do sure. we go from this feedback and these two quantitative, qualitative? There must be a layer of how many students in this class or in this building are meeting these metrics and maybe we identify students that need help. So how do they work together? Sure, okay. So the first two parts are because this DCA is really more focused on the adults, because it's focused on the systems. Um, so you're right that they can feel segregated because what the adults need might not be the same as what the kids need, right? So this is focusing on uh, the adult side of it, which is a lot of what my work is on too. Um, what do the teachers and staff and administrators need to feel supported in delivering interventions to students? Um, and my job was to first identify that so then we could help the teachers in that next process of the student work there mm -hmm. um, so that they'd understand how we could go from taking the MCAS at the top of this pyramid and working down in the same way. Uh, this is just a process for deciding how to do it. Um, how we connect things like decision systems, which is what you were just saying, how do we decide, like data decision rules. That's one main thing that the teachers wrote here and that we scored pretty low on in the actual survey. They said, we thought we had them. After learning more this year, after going to presentations, we realized we don't like what we have and we want to work on that next year and we need help doing that. Um, and some schools felt fine about theirs and other schools were like, I've seen stuff that's better than what I have and I want to do better. Um, and that's how we planned the scope and sequence of those data meetings. That's one of our biggest focuses, is helping them further solidify what they have. Because what they have is good, uh, and it can just be better. Um, and looking at the student outcomes, I think, is what you're kind of getting at. If you correct me if I'm wrong. Well, how, how is it used? I mean, it's open-ended, right? So how we get this information, we gather student information, what are the different connecting points that we have, and what are ideas on how to improve that? Sure, so now we're saying, uh, so they, the, the staff and teachers were saying we want help with interventions, right? So we would say take a check-in, check-out intervention and look at that from the overall view. How is this group of students in this intervention doing overall? So we're at the pyramid again, we're at the top. And then we take it down, like who's responding, who's not? Are there certain types of students this isn't working for? Oh, it looks like we put some um, 
not attention avoiding students in this, it's probably not the best intervention for them. And then taking it down to, uh, and this is a behavior one, but you can do it with academics as well. But taking it down to strand and item, we'll go through those groups of, of teachers to say, well, actually, at our school, we did check and check out this way. Have you tried it? Um, and the, the student work would be them taking either observations or frequency count of behaviors or using Swiss for office referrals. Um, the same can be done with MCATs, going back to the top, uh, looking at our overall math scores, uh, looking at, it looks like most of us did well, but then we look at disaggregated scores. Maybe a section of our high needs students didn't do well. Why is that? Take it down to the strand level. Was it in every math strand, or was it really just an inferential thinking? If it's inferential thinking, what were the items? Where is it open, open question? Was it multiple choice? Was it the same multiple choice for most of those kids that they got tripped up on? And then the, the idea is to not wait till the next MCAS to figure out if were we right that it was inferential thinking, but maybe uh, putting in inferential thinking questions in a quiz or a unit test um, earlier on for student work and then looking at criteria, using that as criteria for maybe we should have a, like an inferential thinking intervention because we'd have a big enough group of kids that this wasn't working <coughs> for, that kind of thing. So it's just a process, but thank you for asking. Yes, Gary. So how many respondents were there to this survey? To this survey? Yeah. Oh, or the other one? No, um, no, the, uh, the one that uh, <laughs> The slide you had just, just up, I think. Is that the correct one? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I was struggling. I think you're talking about the DCA. Oh, I'm talking about oh, the, the DCA. DCA. You're talking yeah. about the DCA. Um, of course, that is a figure I should have on the top of my head, but I don't want to guess. Um, and I don't have it written down on me. But uh, How are they? So, the, just so you know, and I don't know if you said this being the DCA is done. Localized, have an on site person who's more maybe you know, more experienced than they might otherwise be by virtue of learning from you. Sure, yeah, so that is something we're working on, um, cause, and that's a great idea. Uh, it was one of the things that was identified here, and it was one of the things I, I was noticing as I got a little bit more familiar with the position and, and figured out how it would best work. So there is a data analyst on every MTSS team, that's their title. They are at varying degrees of comfort with it, but. Uh, it's a learning process for adults as well. Um, so I do hold training sessions. That's what I did last year as well. Um, and this year, part of those data meetings is a targeted effort to have those three people from every building who come uh, get specific data skills when they leave. Um, and it's expected to be part of workbook pages. Um, and also, to your point, uh, because I, you're absolutely right, it should be available to everyone, too, to kind of look at. Um, I'm working on getting it on the, the website I sent Craig a lot of my, like a lot of my ideas <laughs> like last week. So um, it's a lot of the work that I want everyone to be able to, to get at. Uh, this would be the best if, if everybody knew how to use it and feel comfortable in this way with it. And I think having an on, on-site resource as much as possible mm -hmm. and developing that capability and the coalition of the willing mm -hmm. yeah. would, would be good for everybody. Like I know the, the Title I team uh, has asked me to work with them and, and they're very well, interested in getting well, even teams. more too. So uh, each group has, has different excited people. Good. Yes. I totally understand Nick's question and I'm appreciative of your response, but I, I'm just sort of wondering where these people are finding the time to do this because we we have so many expectations of the classroom. Um, we we need to make sure our teachers are executing, you know, what is required to meet student needs in the classroom, all kids, all classrooms, every day, all the time. So I'm a little like I, I think it's great, but I just I sit here and and I think doing as much online and making these available, but I just not quite seeing where those three people that volunteered are finding the time to build their skill and, and transfer and utilize the skill and help their own teams. Where they, what, what times are they doing that? Sorry. Do you want to go first? So the, the people that Courtney are talking about are part of our building leadership teams that we have in each of our, of our buildings. And those are stipended positions. So they are? And they meet after school. Okay. But I, I also want to say that's a really valid concern, especially because this kind of information isn't the kind of thing
thing you want to be doing at, at midnight. Eh? You shouldn't be up that late. <laughs> yeah. Maybe your room for error grows a lot um, at that time. And so that's a pretty big concern of mine as well. But I've been working with people, a coalition of the willing, uh, so to speak, tend to be specialists who already work with data. I've been targeting people who already use it, and mm -hmm. how can they use it a little bit more tightly? Um, people who, who give presentations on data a lot tend to have a lot of data in their hand, and they don't always know what to do with it. So I'm there to help them through it, because they have to work with it anyway. So it tends to be kind of administrators or specialists right below administrative level of people who have to do it already. Because you're right, I, I was trying the other way, and the people who sign up are the people who sign up for everything because right. they're great at what they do. They're so good and they want to do even better. And I admire that, but I also don't want to burn them out. Right. <laughs> um, but if, you, if you're working all day and you're, you're doing special stuff after school and then you go home and you do something with your family and then you know, you're trying to do this other stuff at uh, between 9.30 and... Well, they're getting a stipend, don't sign up. That, yeah, well... You know, so. <laughs> Right? No, I, 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 that's that's great, but it doesn't sound like we have coverage in all yeah. the schools. Right. So, so it is. So I have been targeting, and a lot of the people on, that are teacher leaders on that MTSS team are people who already have to work with data mm -hmm. through either they already have comfort with Excel, like reading specialists who work with a lot of data as it is. How do we help them feel more comfortable in leading those conversations with the teachers that they already have? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the avenue that, that I've been going in this year so far. No, no, it's okay. I just, I want to put some closure to this, that last year, Courtney's been less than two years here, right? It'll be two in February. Two in February, right. So last year was the first year that the people were exposed to this process. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's a lot of challenges and bumps in the road. This year, and I know Courtney can say this because we've had these conversations, the light switches, the light bulbs are going off all over the place. People are starting to see the benefit of this mm -hmm. process and they're having real substantive conversations about how to use that, that process that you, you've seen tonight, mm -hmm. which is the reason why we wanted to do this presentation before you started seeing other data presentations mm -hmm. this year. Because every time you see a data presentation, you can think about this one to see this is how staff are using the data. Mm -hmm. Could this be more for Craig, I guess, but can you give us a, an example of uh, some successes that have occurred due to the, the collection and, and, and the uh, review of the data. Okay. Yeah, um, so I know the high school teams, which is the biggest team to work with and uh, is broken down departmentally, um, had a lot of interest in figuring out um, how to move their math and their science forward and involve uh, groups for tier two interventions, which they're starting to look at, and they said, how do we know like how everyone did, and how do we make sure we know where they are right when they come in? So they worked with their uh, department PLCs on looking at uh, mathematics strand data, uh, which is exactly the right level. I, I worked with the department heads before that to say, how did our, um, some of our subgroups do compared to all our students in different strands and different types of questions, and then take their scope and sequence and, and put it next to that. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't do well in open, this is an example, this isn't necessarily the one they came up with, but uh, they didn't do well in open response questions. Did, did we give them enough chances to look at word problems and have short responses in math? Maybe we didn't do that. Um, was it that a lot of students leave class in the middle of the day and don't go to uh, general ed classes that are in the afternoon? Uh, can, can we schedule something for those kids who leave uh, early because they have different, uh, different needs or different struggles? How do we help them? Um, so I worked with each of the departments to kind of walk through what they were looking at. So we, we probably, the way I'm retaking it is that we're, it's still in planning stage? No. Or I mean, you're using the data to decide, this is what we're going to do, but we may not necessarily have seen that gap close. Oh, oh like outcomes. Okay. Yeah, an outcome. Well, an important thing that has happened since <coughs> last year and is now happening this year is every school now has scheduled intervention blocks, yeah. which is huge, because now we are using the data to inform who are the students that need those additional interventions. Mm -hmm. so, so every school now has intervention can, blocks. Can you tell us a little bit about the intervention blocks? So they're, they're 
po pockets of time uh, during the during the school week in a in a schedule, and it's usually the same time for all students by either grade level or department, depending on on how it's structured. Where teachers are and tutors and sometimes paraeducators or Title I support is providing support to students in targeted areas. So one school may be focused for the next six to eight weeks on literacy skills. And so their intervention blocks, say they have three 30-minute intervention blocks um, during the week, that it is targeted uh, time with students, with teachers and tutors um, on particular skills based on data that they that they have available to right. them. And now with the intervention block in this process of data, a lot of the times when deciding whether a student will go into an intervention or not, a lot of the time is spent only here, which is really important when you're trying to decide whether a student should get extra support or not. But what, what was missing was the overview. If 17 of your kids need extra support because you're, you're listening one to one to one, which is the natural inclination of an educator, which is a good inclination, you're also missing out those 17 students. If you look at the overall, you see 17 out of my 23. In my intervention block, I don't have to send each of those 17 to an individual activity. How do I work with my reading specialist? How do I work with my Title I coordinator to maybe make groups um, of mixed abilities? And how do we find an intervention that works for everybody and kind of use that? that way to better service at a tier one level before you start uh, sending students out of the classroom for extra support. Mm -hmm. Just to Gary to follow up on your question, I have received reports and they're, they're isolated and, and very limited data uh, sampling, but of positive reports from parents who have identified kind of counting of certain things that help uh, behaviors or, or lesson planning or so forth that because uh, we had a presentation on data last year a few months ago and I've had some conversations with people just you know kind of organically in, in the community and, and the students um, about their experience in the district and, and so I have received some positive feedback uh, about experiences individually with teachers obviously I can't describe where when how but um, these were specific instances all of them where uh, teachers had counted things that had helped the student improve and the parents noticed and appreciated the kind of the, the quantitative as well as the qualitative approach to um, helping their students. So, it, you know, it, at least in those isolated incidents, it's been very helpful. So the intervention blocks would be, let's say, in an elementary school, you know, grade three might have it, might be focused, does everybody in that school focus on that one um, data point, uh, information on that they received on? It data. really is at the, the level, it's at the building level. They're determining what they're going to focus on, and it is for a six to eight week span. And then, so there's, there's, you said there's three blocks during the course of the No, week. no, I, I use that as an example. Every school is different depending on what they had available to them. For example, at the high school, we have the office hour, which is from 7.30 to 8 on Tuesdays, and they have the flex block, which is on Thursdays. So how would it look in an elementary school or middle school? It doesn't have that time. It's different by school, right? Yeah, it's it's all building specific. Yeah, I know. So I'm, give, I'm looking for an example of how I, it would look. Like. Okay, I, I thought he just gave one earlier no, on I'm literacy. Looking, I'm looking at how would it work in, in a, you know, it's Tuesday. We have an intervention block. How does that work? What type of support? And how does it, how is it, um, you know, spread out throughout the building. When so it's, it's usually done by grade level. So say yeah. say grade five at the elementary would have, say Tuesday at 1.30, mm -hmm. they would have 30 minute block where they are focused, they're, they're, there's gonna be certain adults that are gonna be assigned to that block, teachers, classroom teachers, one of them, um, and they're going to be focused on a particular skill or a set of skills that say focus on literacy. Mm -hmm. So the data is going to inform them what they're going to focus on. And they're going to stay focused for six to eight weeks on that particular set of skills. And it's all students? Or is In that grade level. Okay. Okay. Now, there will be some students that won't need the intervention. They may need some additional challenges. So they'll be extending their learning uh, in that block. But really, that's all planned at the building level with the building principal and uh, that grade level team.
-hmm. But each class, each grade level is receiving some of this. Yes. That's scheduled in all, in all the schools. We have intervention blocks. And it varies from, obviously, if you don't have enough support staff to do it all at the same time, it's... No, we, there's no way we could do a whole school at the same, same time at the elementary. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great presentation. In the example that you just gave, Dr. Doherty, with the literacy, is there a mechanism in place for, okay, we're going to, this is the, the thing we're going to work on for six to eight weeks. We've seen data that indicates this needs some additional work. Is there a mechanism in place for identifying, like I'm thinking a post and, and a pre and post assessment? Um, so you mentioned like you might design a quiz to get at, was it um, a particular issue in math? Is there a post assessment so the teachers can say, boy, that intervention really did improve this? Yes. Or, um, Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Because that's why it's done for a six to eight week span. I imagine that's really good. <clears throat> uh, you know, I imagine that actually is going to build more momentum around this. Is mm -hmm. when people see it working, right? Mm -hmm. That then you get much more buy-in. So that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Special education update. All right, so I think you all have um, the attached memo, and I think this was a great framework as to what I was really hoping that as we start to look at the areas in special education, we're looking at it from a, a similar framework mm -hmm. um, with different groups of people. So, what I have done in the memo is really outline some of the steps we've already taken around reading and supporting the bridge program in the district during my tenure because that's really all I can speak to so during 14 15 15 16 and 16 17 I will note that there was one error um, on let's see if well, maybe it was corrected okay looks like it's off right now okay so that looks fine I think it's actually um, on the bottom of the second page where it says summer, it should be summer 2017 oh, yeah. professional development, not summer 2018. That was the one error. Um, so really the question that had come up was what are we doing in response to the OCR concerns that were raised um, and so when I looked at the information and the information that was shared with us through parents, it's really taking a look at the structures we already have and using those structures mm -hmm. with, you know, our MTSS framework, our focus on data as what we just presented on systems and practices, and how do we use our existing systems, the existing system of our CPAC, the existing system of our PLC structures to gather feedback from everyone who is a stakeholder in this. It's, it is our families and our parents who are an important piece. Our student outcome data, how are our students doing and what's that data showing us. And also hearing from our teachers who work day in and day out. As Courtney mentioned, that, that teacher piece, that teacher feedback and the work that they're doing. And so what I've outlined here is a really sense of a timeline of the work that we'll be doing and actually starting tomorrow, I'm, I am having a coffee and conversation at the Parker School for the Parents in the Bridge program. And uh, Mr. Martin and I will be looking at offering some different opportunities for parents to come in and speak and share concerns so we can gather some data from parents um, anecdotally from that information um, and offering some other listening sessions. Um, the CPAC also recommended doing a survey for parents mm -hmm. um, in relation to the bridge program. The target areas are the students and the families in the bridge program and um, students who are receiving specialized reading instruction across the district. So a survey um, uh, came up, a survey for special education teachers to gather some information from them. As I mentioned, some meetings with our special ed teachers, both um, those that work in the bridge program and our elementary learning center um, PLCs to hear their feedback, look at student data. Um, I've reached out to Tufts University. Um, we've kind of been emailing and playing phone tag. They have the capacity to do a program evaluation, so I'm hopeful that that's going to be a great opportunity to work with Tufts as someone outside of the school system to come mm -hmm. in 
and really look at our bridge program as well as the way that we're providing. Again, I, I want to make sure the focus for people understanding is that it's really the specialized reading. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the reading that we provide in the general ed setting, but more of those that we provide under the IEP. Um, and then to gather all that, that's all data, as we just talked about, you know, whether that's through surveys or interviews or conversations, and bringing that data to back to the CPAC and going through a process as Courtney described. I'd like to have a facilitator work um, with us, with the parents, and potentially with our teacher group um, to really go through looking at the data and what is it showing us, using protocols so we can have really good conversation about all these data points um, versus that at that point and then having some recommendations come out of that and then with our goal that our final report out would be in April um, I know you know we're gonna have to make some decisions from a budgetary perspective earlier on mm -hmm. and we'll have to walk through that as we we walk through the budget but I don't think that it's realistic to crunch that to say that by right you know, yeah. December, we're going to know exactly mm -hmm. where we need to go because right. as you look at the list of things above, my hope is that as we go through this process, we're going to find that the roots have taken hold with a lot of the work that was done during 14, 15, and 15, 16, and hopefully we are going to see um, that as we go through this process, um, our students are making them. That's my hope. Uh, it may not be, but that's my hope, is that because the concerns that came up were from 14, 15, and 15, 16, um, that we will see some other, you know, progress happening from that perspective. So that's what I'm proposing in terms of a timeline, and I wanted to make sure that through this process we hear from all stakeholders. I know our parents are an important piece of that, but so are our teachers in this mm -hmm. process. Um, so I wanted to ensure that we were... Um, including those two pieces. Yes. So um, that bullet there about any initial recommendations to the FY19 budget, mm -hmm. that's really sort of what you just spoke yes. to is like that's the timeline that we need to have right. something, but you really won't be done right. with the process because you're really still working through the process with right. all the key stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And then um, so that January to March time frame be to put together that data, mm -hmm. really continue to work with um, all of the parents who who want to be involved in the process mm -hmm. really at that yeah. point. You're not um, sort of limiting that at that, that stage. So, no. it's, so, I mean, the CPAC is our Special Education Parent Advisory Council. That is the group that, um, you know, we rely on to work with mm -hmm. you and provide yeah. Um, be, be engaged in that process, mm -hmm. really. So I don't know. Are the new you have new two new co-chairs? We have we have there. three new co-chairs. New co-chairs. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important that those new people really reach out um, to some of the parents. I know we've received you know a variety of emails, and some people feel like the CPAC doesn't have the reach to to do this. Mm -hmm. But I think. The CPAC is designed to mm -hmm. do this by statute, mm -hmm. by the state. Mm -hmm. We read what they're about. Um, you know, and I think as much as we might have a, um, a school committee member who's a liaison, <coughs> they're just really there to listen and, and sort of report back to us. But the key is for this work to get done and then, you know, for them to report to us mm -hmm. and a, in their sort of annual, that's the... Mm -hmm. guideline from the state is an annual um, readout to the committee so um, I guess how would it be how are like how are people knowing about the coffee and conversation the office hours so the one we're having at Parker the team chair coordinated and she reached out to all the families um, at Parker who are in the bridge program Oh. and notify them via email of it happening. Oh, so so can we, we, are we sort of directly accessing families who are in the bridge program and or mm -hmm. specialized reading mm -hmm. services? Yeah. So like per, not just the, here's the blog. <laughs> no, it's a we, can really, we okay. can really target those families. Okay. And so what's really nice about that is when you work through, again, when you start to look at what our systems are, when I work through, for instance, the team chair at the building level, they know and can gather that information a lot quicker than I can at the district level. So 
the list of their parents and, and for Allison Wright to do that communication to the parents was really quick. You know, we've heard back from some of the families. Um, mm -hmm. so the principal will be there. And so. so the uh, some of the parents from the bridge program were here at our last meeting and mm -hmm. wanted us to set up a task force. Mm -hmm. I think that would be uh, best if they just participated mm -hmm. in the seat pack mm -hmm. process as mm -hmm. opposed to having mm -hmm. a separate mm -hmm. that's kind of correct duplicating. And I think, yep and they can come you know we're happy to schedule individual so meetings. they're aware of that and can that's mm -hmm. a place where they can have a voice in that process mm -hmm. right I guess we, should, we, should, we just need to be so some of those people I don't know if they um, they can watch this they can listen to this they could be here or if they are parents of students currently in those programs and receiving those services they will will have already sort of received a personal contact and we um, I did share this with the CPAC for the, the memo specifically to them prior to this oh. meeting because mm -hmm. um, some of them hadn't reviewed it in the packet so I gave them all copies ahead of that so I'll be thinking about and report out to you in terms of what communication we're going to do to all of those families to let them know um, mm -hmm. yes I, I just had a question just estimates the number of students in the bridge program ballpark I would say max we have is probably 25 25 students, students. I was gonna say 30 25 to 30 that's um, throughout the throughout, district throughout the district that's throughout up the to district. high school and 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 out of 400 some on IEPs 800 800 some on okay so mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a small number mm -hmm. so one thing you said here in the 2017 yep. 18 you said you're ensuring not only compliance but mm -hmm. also um, working toward improved student mm -hmm. outcomes who's reading the 25 IEPs to make sure that we're following them the team chairs are our okay. administrators review all of those so and have the principals. we have, have we included I, I would feel good mm -hmm. if I saw that as a bullet point mm -hmm. here that that we're going to include in some evaluative manner of of the right person that people will be accountable for reading the IEPs for each student in the program and following them um, and and that goes not just for the bridge mm -hmm. program but I mean I, I know 800 is a, is a lot of students but it's, it's about mm -hmm. 18 percent 15 roughly percent. It's in line with our state yeah. average. That we have that to. Is our but process. we have to do yeah, that. Yeah, that, that but, is our process for. But going to making making sure that mm -hmm. that that is is front and center, mm -hmm. and, and this is good that we have these you know, opportunities to mm -hmm. gather inputs from the, you know, stakeholders and parents, and um, but I want to make sure we read the IEPs. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a second? Sure. Questions. Well, all right. Um, Sorry. There's mention of dyslexia, the students with dyslexia, there's a few things here mm -hmm. that's specifically called out on the mm -hmm. last page of the memo. Um, joining an association and then you have teachers that had apparently one day training mm -hmm. uh, recently and then five teachers having a training available to them and then some grant um, based uh, opportunities for additional resources. Have we requested or, or you know, kind of set a goal to obtain feedback on these opportunities from parents and I think the CPAC process is a good one since you mentioned that community and that is a community that that we heard public comment about mm -hmm. um, parents affected by with with uh, students having dyslexia I'd really be uh, interested in receiving specific feedback on what they view as the options and the resources that they think would be most effective for the CPAC to evaluate for the district to evaluate and making sure that we're getting that perspective included and that, that we're kind of, I don't know if waiting is the right term, but you know, that, that the parents who self-educate on, on matters most affecting their kids, that we mm -hmm. want to make sure that we elicit those perspectives from our community mm -hmm. um, for, for all student needs, not just dyslexia. But right, So if there's some way to make sure, hey, we're going to have a public comment process, but we're going to ensure mm -hmm. that for the subpopulations of our students, who have these different dyslexia is one example, but I'm sure there are other diagnosed mm -hmm. types of, um, of student need in special ed that we get a certain representative number of, of parental input comments or whatever, and we really set that as a goal in the survey process, right? That we get a sampling that's um, hopefully as representative as possible by the people most closely affected and knowledgeable in our community to help us learn as a district how best to serve their students. So you're looking for us to sort of set a goal about how many families we'd hope to hear from so you know it's so, something with the, just making sure that, that you, when it comes to the steps that you know you listed here for dyslexia mm -hmm. is you know what are what do parents with children think 
that will provide for their kids? Are there other steps that they would advocate for their kids and, and like to hear? Uh, and they want to know that they're heard and represented in this process. I just want to give them every assurance that we're not going to close the gates of a survey before we hear you know, a, a representative number of perspectives from each of the different types of student student needs. So well, I'm, I'm just focusing this year really on the bridge program and the specialized reading. I think and that's a good oh, start. I think that Which really is, the is where that's we need program, to, correct? It's our students with yeah. language based learning disabilities. Is, right. So. Yes. And they it may are the bridge in that program. That program right. 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 Others. Okay, I just want to make sure that you got that. They I got that. No, I, I get that. Yeah. Right, but I, but I get that, but I want to kind of set the, you know, we look at we have a process here that goes beyond this this school year, right, going down to the bottom of the page, and that's what I'm saying, like, as we move through that process of gathering survey data and so forth, that we have a, a strong start with students affected by the bridge program, but that we're doing that across all of our special ed in a systematic way. I know we can't do everything at once, but um, we want to make sure that we hear the perspectives from parents who have educated themselves, and I think have a lot to, uh, that, that we can hear and should hear and consider in evaluating how, how to use the resources within our district. So parents may say like, oh, that doesn't work, or I like this. People have different opinions, but people also have experiences that I think we need to listen to. Jean. Um, so thank you for the memo yes. and the thoughtfulness, yes. and I um, appreciate the discussion that we're having. Um, this gets at one subpopulation mm -hmm. where clearly there's some concern, mm -hmm. so that's good. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Boffin just talked about sort of the other issue, which is IEP compliance, mm -hmm. which is a huge concern. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the second thing that we've sort of chatted about. The, the third thing that we discussed with the OCR mm -hmm. was classroom space mm -hmm. and adequacy. And particularly, one, um, one parent asked a question about mm -hmm. a Coolidge in particular and the room divider. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering um, what work you've been doing or are doing sure. to ensure that all classroom spaces mm -hmm. are in compliance. So two weeks ago, we reviewed the OCR complaint um, and the resolution agreement with all of our principals, um, assistant principals, and with our legal counsel present. So we had the opportunity to review the intricacies of the findings with all of our principals. Um, since that time, we've had lots of con discussions with um, principals about that. The concern was about Coolidge, yeah. and I did meet with the principal and we looked at the spaces. So they have some spaces that are divided with an accordion wall. The difference between those programs and those spaces and the bridge program is that it is a middle school, so there may be two small group instructional classes happening, one on either side of the divider. When the bell rings, they all leave and go somewhere else. Those students are not in that classroom all day. Um, the only concern we had was during um, the lunch blocks at the middle school, and I, I look to my former middle school principals, yep. there are times when classes one, one overlap. Time. Right now we have found that one day, one period, there is a scenario where um, one class leaves before the other class because of just the lunch schedule. So we're working on that. The concern is to move the class for one period, one day in the cycle might be disruptive for those students. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to kind of explore that more. I also want to have a caveat that we do have shared spaces. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want there to be an understanding by the board, uh, you know, or the community that we don't have shared spaces. We do have shared spaces. The scenario at Joshua Eaton was a very unique set of circumstances. And so um, the CPAC brought that up as concerns. Uh, when our last meeting on the 4th, there were concerns brought up. Um, and so we've talked about those pieces. I've brought any concerns that are coming up back to the buildings but you know we have shared spaces because each learning center teacher does not have their own classroom space um, so we just need to be mindful of that so Coolidge is where we were most concerned the principal has done the work um, in looking at that and her and I are going to go back through to see if there are any other viable options whether that is to move that class for every period every day you know every day in the cycle that period to a different location would be you know, we can see if that's an option or they have the space to do that. So was Thank you. the criticism in the OCR complaint an accordion wall or a divider? It was. A it was not. Right? It was not an accordion wall. It was um, some like whiteboard right. sort of. Yeah. So it's different. Yeah, the accordion wall covers the entire right. room. Right. It's yeah. not. Yeah. 
it's not like I a chocolate. Just yeah. One other, I'm sorry. No one other question uh, on the landmark outreach and then uh, opportunity for T. What's what does that mean by pending grant funding? Uh, no, what if we don't funding. get the grant? Then I won't have the opportunity to fund that. So, so we're not we, doing it until we know whether we the, have the grant funding is the we we get certain professional development. No, I funding. know what it is. Yeah. I'm just I didn't know whether we were paying for it with the but we're waiting to see right. what the grant hasn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. We we will re most likely receive grant funding. We just don't know how much right now. The grant process has been very slow this year at the federal and state level. Is that kind of follow? Is that the same for the district-wide data team? So all three of those mm -hmm. bullets there are. So in order to, mm -hmm. in order to, to get the, do the work that you really want to do, we just run away. Did we need that grant funding? And then the, this other, um, which is professional development for mm -hmm. teachers. Um, I guess I just had. Can I just so the the, the problem, uh, the issue at Code where there is, um, some situation that you would like to improve mm -hmm. is. It's one day, one period. Yes. One day in the seven day. Yes. It's, seven it's, or six. it's at lunch. It's six day, six day cycle. Okay. It's lunch one day when kids are coming in at the same time class is going on. So you've got a sixth grade group coming in when there's a seventh grade class happening. Oh, it's because it's already in process. Because the bells are not the same. Yeah. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. I get it. I get it's it. Lunch. So that's the one thing we're looking at right now. Oh, yeah. you don't have bells. They don't have bells. They just have clocks. Back, <laughs> just back to, I don't know whether John or, or Carolyn, back to the grant funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I didn't see anything else in here that was pending. I guess my feeling is if, if we don't, can you report back? And Because it mm -hmm. seems to me yep. that yep. regardless of grant, yeah. I still want to see that yep. done. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're assuming we're going to get the grant funding. We right. just yeah. have not and heard a lot from the federal government the, and the state government. One caveat with the grants is you can't charge anything until it's actually been approved. So if we incurred the expense now and the grant was approved later, you can't. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it go you. by, go right. go by the wayside because mm -hmm. either we the right. grant was late or we didn't get the grant because right. uh, mm -hmm. it seems to me it's something we should be doing. Yeah, that's definitely been the challenge we're having, you know, as we go through this, is that we did choose to take all the professional development funding out of special education um, for this budget cycle. And so any opportunities that I have are having to wait until we receive grant funding, which has limited my ability to even kind of negotiate with some of our um, you know, vendors or PD providers because we don't have, uh, we don't know the dollar amount and I don't know when it's gonna, Did like what the start date is, so I don't wanna set dates, if that makes sense. Yes. I, I think you just answered my question and I think the answer is you don't know, but do you have any sense of time frame of when we're gonna hear about these grants? The one that's my professional development, I have seen nothing. You've seen nothing. We've started to reach out to them as well. There's a couple of grants that we historically have received that we're still waiting for the window to open up for the application. So I want to reassure the committee that if, we've, if we're, we feel we're in a situation where grant funding is not going to be available, we will come back to you and we will say we will be doing this. Yeah, thank you. And, right, we need to. I wasn't that direct, but that's what I thought. <laughs> I will. Are we done with a couple things Mm -hmm. Sure. So, Carolyn, did, anything else on the memo? Maybe. Uh, kind of a broader point, but it's best if, because yeah. it, it's not directly with the memo. Yeah. Um, just thank you for this. This is very detailed. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good kind of game plan for going to the future, and, it, and I think we can talk more about, be interested in yeah. hearing a presentation on what you yeah. learn. Uh, from from these and also the dates that we identified in the OCR complaint, we'll meet those and we'll, we'll, we'll keep the compliance with the IEPs. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a piece of this that just for last week, from last week's discussion that we didn't talk about. I feel like we had a, a good, robust discussion about next steps and what I would call kind of reactive leadership. And I say we as a committee um, here, um, broader than just you know, Ms. Wilson, a very good summary last week, good presentation, and, and a good memo here. 
this is stepping back from that to say just two things that to me need need to be said about proactive leadership for us as a, as a committee, myself included, all of us. Um, just thinking about, you know, our role and, 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 it, and the superintendent's role together in leading the district uh, and making sure that, you know, as a committee, we're setting the right goals, asking the right questions, um, providing the right criteria for the district, and, and there's an evaluation process that the public has of us when, when, when we're on the ballot, and then we, by law, have of, of the superintendent. And part of that performance is, is, is proactive and looking forward. And we make some really difficult decisions as a committee about budget and about balancing um, many good options. And I just want to say, and I, and I felt strongly last week, but it wasn't the right time to say it, because we're focused on the future, about it, it's important that you know, we hold ourselves accountable and, and that we play that, that role of, of helping bring our separate perspectives to the superintendent in, in the context of setting the right goals and priorities, that following the law is, is proactively in the future is, is not an option in this district and that these are you know very serious findings by this this OCR uh, Office of Civil Rights with involving two students over two years so just for the future it's just a charge to myself and others um, as we go about our roles in setting policy setting budgets um, guiding the superintendent with uh, clear goals and asking questions of all the speakers that we continue to keep in mind that we're not just fighting the war of the past, not just addressing this issue, looking backwards, which we need to do, but we need to simultaneously look forward and say, where, where are, are the risks of these types of, of events happening in the future, and how do we do everything we can to prevent them? Right, so it's, I, I just want to cast that broader net. We'll, we'll have more conversations in the future. I didn't think we had much of a chance last week to talk about <coughs> proactive leadership. I mean, I'll give a separate example of the superintendent on this in the, in the comments that I'll highlight from, you know, on a separate issue, but in an example of proactive leadership, I think the superintendent's comments on uh, from Reading of Races Diversity in today's packet are an excellent example of proactive leadership and going after an issue proactively, making sure that we not only address the issues in the past, but think about the future. And I just want to take on the same um, commitment for us as a committee in working with the superintendent, because we don't just want to address the two OCR complaints that mm -hmm. we've addressed. We want to prevent mm -hmm. these types of things from happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, I appreciate that, and I think that um, you know, from one perspective, I think Dr. Darty and his leadership team have been proactive and have always done their best to be proactive. And I feel like, for as many years as I've served on this board, there's been too many years when it's just been a struggle in terms of the decisions that we have to make um, about where we're putting, you know, limited funding. I think. The only time it wasn't a struggle was the like three or four years after the last override, and um, it was there wasn't you know as much angst over trade-offs, and so you know we we ultimately have that leadership responsibility um, because you know we're providing the guidance and the funding for this team to do what they do best. So um, I agree wholeheartedly that we we need to keep doing that and finding ways to do that better for our community. Thank you, Nick. Is that it? Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Yes, the budget. Speaking of budget. budget. So included in the packet is the memo that summarizes how we completed the fiscal 2017. And what we've done in this memo is to change the presentation a little bit to show the data in a couple of different charts that we think might help articulate where some of the final surpluses came. But we did end the year with just over $451,000 of surplus, which is approximately 1% of the budget. That was split among salary savings. So we had $189,000 of salary savings across all of the various schools. Within special ed, there was approximately 169,000. And what we did want to um, point out as Carolyn and I go through the 17, 18, is that we did have the ability last year to prepay tuition. So that did help to offset the accommodated costs in the current year. We also received a little bit of extra funding within the circuit breaker reimbursement. And a lot of this, the timing of that is 
as Carolyn mentioned throughout the year, she was going through a lot of negotiations and discussions throughout the year, so the legal costs and the tuition and associate transportation, a lot of that was not known until really, I want to say the last week mm -hmm. of November, so we worked through a lot of that where we had thought a lot of the funding w was going to be utilized for that. And then we were able to prepay approximately $270,000 of tuition that'll help offset the cost this year. We are allowed to prepay up to three months of tuition, and there is also caps on how much you can. You cannot prepay an extraordinary amount of tuition for the next year with prior year funding. So we usually look to keep it between the two seventy to $300,000 in prepayments. And so that's gone once it's prepaid. Once it's so prepaid, if something so the changes, yes, yes, we thank lose you. That's the a money. Excellent question. So we do look long and hard at it because it is prepaid. If we encumber the funds using FY17 and the student comes back in district, does not go to that program, we do not get the ability to reuse that funds for something else. So very good mm -hmm. question. So uh, between Carolyn and yeah, myself, and Anne Marie, we go through student by student and try to look at the ones where we can say we're really certain this is where they're going to go, they're going to stay if it's summer we're prepaying because it is once you identify the student and the program, we we can't reallocate it. So we'd rather go back to free cash than to Yes, mm. to risk. It would go yeah. back eventually throughout the next year but um, and we did look to keep to the extent it was within the accommodated cost respect in the accommodated cost part of it also in there um, within the administration cost center we had talked about the position that we had intentionally not filled during the year so that salary savings went back within the facilities there were two items um, one the cleaning contract that at last November's town meeting additional funds had been put towards that, but based upon the cleaning contract and what we had scheduled, those funds were not ultimately utilized, as well as at the end of the year as part of the collective bargaining negotiations. We had negotiated the longevity buyout. Due to the timing of when that happened, we had received funding for that in case we weren't able to fund it out of the salary savings. So, and we had said at the meeting with FinCom, in June that most likely we were not going to need it, but we didn't want to risk closing out the year and not having it since we had settled it. So those two items are part of what got turned back for facilities as well. Thank you. Ms. Um, I think this is the most detailed memo we've ever gotten. So I just wanted to say thank you. I, it was really, really well written. Very clear and easy to understand and very thorough. So I appreciated the level of detail that you provided. Um, I have one quick question. So we turned back around 1%. My memory is that, that is fairly consistent with the past, but I'm going from memory. I didn't look. Ooh, it is a little bit higher yeah. than Okay. It Usually it's been between 0.5 to 1%. Usually like 250. Okay, so it's a smidge high. Okay. Uh, it's higher. And part of it was some of the items like that we had talked about earlier in the year that were within those cost centers for that reason that we had said we're, we're going to. But so thank you. We're, we're looking to make the memo more informative to people as we go. So this is the direction we're looking to head as we go through fiscal 18 and then work towards the 19 budget is to, and I think Dr. Nyan, this goes to some of the questions that you had asked to really start to pinpoint where the savings are to the extent we're utilizing them how we're doing it. So this was the first foray into adjusting how we're presenting and disclosing the data for you. I agree with what Jean had to say. I do have one question. I was reading ahead, so I missed uh, the uh, section on um, prepaying some of our special ed costs. So yes. how much did we end up? We ended up paying prepaying 270000 Okay. using last year's funds for the current fiscal year, which will help offset. So that would be on top of the 451 change it's that we It's let the 450 reflects the fact that we were able to prepay. Yeah. We've, we've been consistently doing that for about three years three now. Years. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that that was on top of the mm -hmm. 451. Yes, it was. Had we not done that, we would have turned, would have turned that down back. But that historically, we have, and it is within mm -hmm. the Mass General Law that we can, and we do try to keep it to a set amount to do that. 
Thank you. Good uh -huh. job. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, just a couple questions. This is an excellent memo. I, I agree with everyone has spoken so far. The question I have is for the salary savings, do, do we model a certain rate of turnover in our, our budget when we, we set it? We currently do not. What we have historically done is a bottoms up budget where we look at all of the current positions that we currently have, known people we budget their known salaries for next year based upon the assumptions that we discussed. For any open positions we have, we budget an average salary, so we look at where people have been coming in and utilize that. What then tends to happen, it's a combination of retirements, which sometimes, depending on where the person is, we may not know about those retirements until the end of the year. There are also instances throughout the year where you may have an unpaid leave of absence, so somebody may, you could have an individual that may go out on paternity leave for six to eight weeks unpaid. You may have individuals who go on maternity leave who may get eight weeks paid and take four weeks unpaid. So some of that's difficult to tell the timing of it and then the timing of when we fill positions. As um, Carolyn mentioned, we do have a couple of positions that are still open in the current year that we might be using a host of different things. If we use a substitute, we may have some savings. If we have to outsource it, it may be more expensive. So what we're doing this year when we're going through is we're trying to factor all of that in to try to determine is there a way to be able to gauge it. What we also caution a little bit about, which we had happen at Coolidge last year, is we actually had an administrator that was out on, an, on a paid leave of absence for a significant portion of the year, and we also had the replacement in place. So we can have instances where it works in our favor in instances where it goes the opposite direction. So we've also been tracking this year to say, what's our hiring practice? And we've had a mix this year. We've had several where people have come in at higher salaries than the outgoing person. So we're, we're trying to look at that to say, is there a safe assumption? But what it allows us is the flexibility when we do have to outsource or we are carrying the two salaries. Okay, off the top of your head, do you know how many retirements we had this past year? Oh, she doesn't have to do it off the top. So at 6-30-2016, so last year we had five, five. known retirements. Um, and then I think we had four additional during the year. So if the individual, based upon the collective bargaining agreement, if they're not eligible for any of the buybacks, they don't have a notification period to let us know. So we may not find out until... Yeah. Does that help, year. knowing that, though? Um, I'm trying it, to remember it, what. it does because it allows us to look at it differently. The, the problem is now is we're now reaching a point where we have less and less of those people that have been here long enough because you, you have to have been hired before 96. Um, what's happening now is people that have been hired after 96 are retiring. They're telling us they're retiring, but they don't have to tell us till March, April, May. So would it be advantageous to... You know, go back to the previous method of buyback so that you know, I think that's why they did it. I could be mistaken. Yeah, I, I don't know if you oh, want to yeah, talk yeah. about collective yes. bargaining yeah. Yeah. in I guess this. I knew that would come up. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent we do know about a retirement, then we can look at what we think, has, what we might replace the person if they're depending where they are. But again, we are starting to see a shift to that. We're not necessarily always hiring at the lower it also depends the on the position yeah we've had a um you know if there's a position where the pool is deeper you know it may be different than a than one of those positions that have that are more difficult to find i do i do recall though at one point and uh john you might too that during one of those budget crisis years when we were looking to try to save salary for those following year there was some sort of uh buyout i don't think i don't know if it was, it was an early retirement incentive, early retirement incentive. Um, it actually doesn't work as well anymore because of the new mtrs yeah well not new but recent more recent changes in mtrs was that a contractual that was contractual yeah we don't want to Question on timeline. So every year we, and I guess everyone in town does this, but just 
we have to make these estimates of staff turnover basically in February for actually, it would actually be in December for when even we're earlier the yeah. so we do that in December of year one <laughs> and then that budget begins in what July it's, um, year. For non-union, it would for the teachers. It really begins in September. September. Technically, our so fiscal year doesn't start till September one. If you think and, about and it, and then it goes all the way through to the following Correct. summer, right? So, so we're making these these estimates coming in within one percent. We're doing this about eighteen over an eighteen month. It's actually window. August thirty first. Yeah. Yeah. Forty two hundred yes. students. <laughs> so it's the same for yeah. this as well right. as for special ed tuition. So we're actually not only looking to see how we are for eighteen. We're also trying to build. Out of district for 18 to 20 months into the future. So we can only, and that's where I was going actually, was at the special ed question here. So we have some funds here for special ed, about 168, 69K. So we can only prepay three months of out of district mm -hmm. tuition, right? Mm -hmm. So we're capped on, yeah. we, we spend what we can. Yeah. Is there anything else? And, and these books close. This is FY17, so right. these closed back in July, yeah. right? These June, books are June 30th. June, July, June 30th, okay. July 1st, <coughs> before July 1st. So I guess the question is, is there anything else we could have done? There were some positions in the bridge program discussion that we mm -hmm. talked about being grant dependent. Mm -hmm. are, are there any opportunities in FY18 when we look at, and it's still early mm -hmm. in the year, I guess, comparatively, so but just, you, I just see this yeah. number and I think yeah. about grant funded positions yeah. and I think, none can we do the, more for special yeah. ed with these funds? None of the funding for, for the bridge is, is positions are grant funded. It's Those are um, PD for PD. PD. That 168000 just to give you some context, that could be one out of district placement right. for one year. For one but student. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot so of things that actually, we could spend it on. Um, having that at the end of the year isn't bad because we could have had a student move in, we could have an unexpected placement that could have cost us that amount um, very easily. So, it, it, um, so it, it, it's not a generous reserve and it's one that in some right. contingencies you really yeah. might need. We, up yeah. until the end of the month, were determining whether or not we had any settlements that were going mm -hmm. to occur in June. So it was a very, mm -hmm. I think I probably spent 10 hours a week minimum with Carolyn going through student by student, mm -hmm. settlement by settlement, legal fees associated with it to determine mm -hmm. where we were. And we do, for some of the other areas, look to say what can we, which is how we'll be looking to report it this year to the extent we do have some savings. Mm -hmm. How can we change that? We did, um, working with Mr. Martin at the end of the year where we knew we were taking some of the per pupil in technology out of the FY18 budget, mm -hmm. we were able to reallocate some of the salary savings in FY17 to purchase the technology to mm -hmm. do some of the curriculum items that we were able to do in 17, knowing that we had taken it we out of 18. Because we were cutting it out of 18. Mm -hmm. So we did, we do a lot of that analysis. And it's hard well. to at the end because it is a crunch and we can't prepay, for instance, for professional development. So you know, if you wanted to send a teacher to training in July, well, I can't use those funds to pay for training in July because it's happening after the fiscal year has closed. So it's really limited in what we can use any surplus funding for, which is why we really focus on the prepay. But as you know, and we've talked about decisions regarding placement and IEP meetings happen up until the last day of school. And so we have to be prepared and have the funding available and uh, because we can't always anticipate what will happen to an IEP team process because that's, you know, they're individual. Yeah. They're based on what's happening for that student at that time. So we really want to make sure we do have funding in that line. Um, yeah, I mean, I know it's nice to pre -pay, be able to prepay and, and to, you know, have a, num a number at the end of the year that's true to, to what the budget was. But I'd much rather make a mistake and have that money go back to free cash than off somewhere where, you know. So. Right. And we've always been returning like about a, usually it's closer to about a half a percent and then we've had a few years where it's, you know, around a percent. And, you know, I, we, I believe we've done that every year. I, we've never gone and asked for a reserve or any transfers. and. So, not since accommodated. Right, right. 
not since we changed that model. Um, just to the point about, I mean, we, we had issues where we had um, to provide services through RISE that were not expected mm -hmm. right. at the beginning yeah. of the year. Right, so we had the, the per perfect example within mm -hmm. this budget that when it goes the other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have something else? No, it's good. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the last item on the agenda. Is the calendar. Last item on is the calendar. So uh, we had a, uh, or the discussion came up about the fact that uh, late, uh, late Veterans Day falls on a Saturday. And you would explain to us when we talked about the calendar back in. A year ago. A year ago. That, uh, <laughs> when we approved it. <laughs> What did, because it was on a Saturday, that's when this. So now is there's been some question about. No, I, um, it it's been discussed enough. So I, since yep. this is a committee decision, I felt it was important that the committee review it, and you know, after discussion with you, we, that's why it's yep. on the agenda. So um, I guess I'd just like to open it up. Does anybody? So Dr. Darty laid out a potential plan if we change things where the last day of school would would it would get moved to the 21st to the 21st well that's if all five days are used so and days. yeah and we would uh, then have November 10th is it November 10th Friday. would be a non November Friday November 10th would be a non school a, as a non school day we and need to make this decision soon it has to be nice. really it has yeah. to be tonight yeah. So, so is the uh, non-school day for, every, well, I'd say everyone, huh? <laughs> Teachers and students. So does anybody have any? Where's the calendar? Do we yes. have a calendar here? Just gut instinct, like not, I'm open to any discussion, but I am concerned about communicating out to parents with yeah. three weeks notice that they've yeah. got to find childcare. Yeah. yeah. This, this calendar was published a year ago. And I know I, at least in my house, I take the school calendar and I mark up the calendar. I know yep. I, I, I am a little bit concerned about impact to families. I, I think the people that. I think one of the concerns that came up was uh, we're one of very few districts that don't have that. So there's potentially staff members in our district who live in other communities that are going to have that yeah. question with. Just, just so, yeah, just so you're aware, uh, ourselves, Newburyport, Weston, North Andover, uh, they all have school currently on that day. There are some school districts um, that have uh, professional days for teachers on that day. I just want to add that I've done a lot of research on it, and um, I've actually reached out to some administrators in other districts. And um, I'd say the vast majority of school districts are closed on that day. Um, I haven't, you know, it's feasible that they maybe have a professional development. I haven't heard of that. I went up 93, 128, 95, and, uh, you know, I was sort of taken back by it. And the reason I, I brought it up was uh, I work, as some people know, at Salem State, happened to teach on Wednesdays and Fridays, and I noticed that uh, I had that off, and I'm thinking, hmm, wow, that's, I, thought, I didn't, and, that, and I'm not faulting Dr. Darty on it, but I think the impression was that, you know, because it was on a Saturday, it didn't have to be celebrated on Friday. Um, and I, I certainly understood that, and I know that is essentially um, a truth, and, and, uh, but it's just so few that do it. And I do think, you know, it, it's celebration of a patriotic day that celebrates um, uh, all of our service members, people that have served in the uh, armed forces. and. I can speak from my own personal, my father and my father-in-law both uh, served, whereas Veterans Day is really celebrated for those that have died in the war. But um, I think it's an important day that uh, should be observed. But um, I can also appreciate what uh, Ms. Borowski said, but I, I do think uh, um, that it's, it's a day that uh, is worthy of uh, celebrating um, uh, or observing, let's say, on the day previous to our day after on Sunday. Yes. 
Um, so I, I understand that it's it's a, that we need to take this day annually to observe Veterans Day, and this high school is dedicated right to it's veterans yeah, uh, yeah. who have served and continue to serve, and there is an unbelievably beautiful memorial outside of our school. And I, I would hope that as uh, maybe people on that Saturday will come by and have a moment of um, silent reflection there would be a good spot to do it. But I really feel like with three, slightly over three weeks between now and that day, that the, and I haven't heard from, from families um, at, at all um, about really wa wanting we should have had that off. I think people are surprised. I think when you explain sort of this is how the state sets up the holidays and that's what we did and we sort of, you know, maybe we could have had a richer dialogue about it last March if we approved the calendar. November. In November. Yeah. November. A year ago. You, you yeah. approved the calendar a year ago. Right, because everybody always later. wants us to approve the calendars early. Um, so I, I really think that the the amazing task of trying to get to notification out to people and then have people, parents, change their schedules so to provide child care is one that we would end up with a pretty significant backlash. So I, I, I would hope that the community is not interpreting it as, you know, our um, unwillingness to acknowledge the service of, of veterans and, and current military <coughs> because that's not the case. We basically were following the guidelines of the state I just feel like um, except the state doesn't follow those guidelines. State, state uh, employees, non-essential state employees, are the day off. Well, there's no mail. And, you yeah, know. I, I guess we we followed what was laid out. Whether the state right. didn't but follow it, I mean, it may have been so accurate to some degree. I, I just think it's, and I, I, I um, obviously it's unfortunate that it will impact some of our teachers. Uh, potentially those teachers though potentially have been planning for that and and either that's a, a personal day I guess or they they will make whatever arrangements they need to make where and, and so they've been planning for that because this has been the calendar since the start of school year whereas the 4,200 children families I don't know how many families that is I don't know, uh, but those families have not been planning for this and it would be I think uh, I don't want to create a hardship. Yes. Just something else to keep, as I'm processing this, to keep in mind is the precedent we'd be setting about revoting a calendar. Yeah. Um, it's just something to be in mind. We vote the calendar every November. Mm -hmm. I would hate to see us, we just have to be really careful about establishing a precedent that if we change our mind six months later, maybe we'll vote a different calendar. That would create an uncertainty. That wouldn't be good for any staff or family or anybody. Yes. Veterans Day is not a floating holiday. It's a very specific day and time. And it's intentionally made that way. And to say, oh, we'll do it on another day, that just isn't right. Well, it's, it's actually it's Saturday, a, the November federal government 11. actually allows you to do it and actually does recommend it. I know what you're saying. It is, you know, it's not like Labor Day or Memorial Day, but it is, in fact, celebrated. Uh, it's a federal holiday. And uh, you know you can choose to not observe it on the on the uh, tenth. But as I said, all uh, you know of every state university is closed that day, and uh, the vast majority of uh, school districts are closed. And I, again, I just go back to the the fact that it's a tribute to um, our, our those that have served in the armed forces. And I think that's a very cons that, that's something that's I think very important in this day and age. We hear a lot about. Um, you know, our, our veterans coming back from um, the Gulf Wars, and um, you know, I, I just think it's something. And I, I don't know if our, uh, and I'm thinking more about the value of our our youngsters, our students appreciating it, and uh, the discussion that comes up. Well, why do we have this day off? Well, this is a Veterans Day, whereas I don't think it'll be as significant if it's celebrated on a Saturday to them because they have Saturday off anyways. And, there's about a million other things going on with but all veterans are do we know for a fact I mean probably most Veterans Day celebrations are being held on the day they're on, on they're on Saturday, Saturday. 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 right uh, I wouldn't and, disagree with that uh, not that Friday 
So. Right. The, the guidance was that the, the holidays, when it falls on a Sunday, it's observed on a Monday. So next year, next year will be, it would be the Monday. We would will be have holiday. the Monday holiday, even though Veterans Day is on the Sunday. But that Saturday holidays are observed on Saturday, and that was the guidance that we followed. Yeah, well, I think the guidance wasn't as accurate as we thought. So. I, I, I agree, but I really I, I agree, obviously, with both points that Jean made, which is I, I think that people have been planning, and it's very, we'll, we'll, we'll put families in a difficult position, and I think that, um, you know, the, I also would agree, I would be a little concerned about a precedent uh, setting. And I do think people will have the opportunity to celebrate on Saturday. I do not know offhand what events are being planned in our community, but I'm sure the ba our band is doing something yeah. somewhere in town on Saturday. To it, it's on board. Saturday, and it starts at 11 o'clock. And it's always very beautiful. It, yeah. It's always a very It's on the common. So um, I, I know we, I think, I don't know whether we're going to take a vote, you know, make a motion yeah, to take a motion. vote. I can make the motion if we want to make the motion. In there. Yeah. I, this has been a really good discussion. There's a lot of viewpoints here. For me, the key thing is that families need to rely on that calendar. So for me, it's it's stare decisis that the school committee votes once a year on a calendar. This these are excellent considerations. It's it's an important holiday. It's important to recognize all those who serve in our community, and it's something that should be part of next year's discussion, in my view, at this point. Uh, I'm open to other, anything else anyone else wants to say, but at this point for me it's about allowing families to rely and set their schedules by that calendar and not having to set a precedent of, well, did the school committee vote to change that or not, or having to, right. families should just you put it on the calendar, on your refrigerator, that is this Reading School calendar and people can rely on that. To me that's, that's key. And the other point, I just final point, is the schools do recognize Veterans Day. I know that the Joshua Eaton has their uh, present ceremony every year. There's several uh, schools in the district that have Veterans Day ceremonies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a motion and then if we can still have a discussion. Sure. Um, so move to change November 10th to a holiday in observance of Veterans Day and move the last day of school from June 20th, 2017 to June 21st. I mean, June 20th, 2018 to June 21st, 2018, if all five snow days are used. The second. Or second. Yeah, second. Any further discussion? Taking a vote? Yeah. Vote in favor. All those in, fa in favor? Dr. Nyan? Opposed? I think it, it was made clear that we all were unanimous in our support of veterans. Yes. Yeah. Um, See how it's received. Well, I do. I do hope that people participate. We are, yeah, we already had the discussion. All right. Is that it? That's it. Uh, motion to adjourn. Then. Second. All those in favor.